right. Welcome, everybody. And um, thanks so much for joining us today. We're really looking forward to this conversation. And um, we are here today to talk about digital project management, um, which I am really excited about because we've got a fantastic panel of folks from all different perspectives, um, folks who are doing project management from the consulting side, in-house at nonprofits and different sorts of roles. Um, so I think we're going to get a really great um, set of perspectives on this topic um, and looking forward to hearing uh, input from our audience today as well. Um, my name is Patty DeBow. I'm the president of Parsons TKO, um, and I come from a long background in consulting, doing strategy consulting with um, nonprofits, government agencies, and commercial organizations for a number of years, and was trained as a project manager through that, um, received my PMP, and was leading projects large and small um, through my whole consulting career. And so this topic is near and dear to my heart. Um, I think project management is something that's really critical to anyone, no matter what your role is on the team, you always have an opportunity to sort of apply some of these principles. Um, if you're not familiar with us, Parsons TKO is a consulting firm that works with fundraising, outreach, marketing, um, other sorts of engagement professionals in the mission-driven space. Um, we help folks with our philosophy that we call engagement architecture, which takes a kind of broad look at the people, process, and technologies that power your outreach. Um, and so we're happy to have you joining us today, and um, we'll certainly be sharing a lot of our other content along the way and with you afterwards. So with that, I am very excited to introduce you all to the fantastic panel of folks that we have with us today. Um, and I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves and as they're giving an intro to talk a little bit about the types of projects that they oversee in their current role and or have experience with in the past. Um, so we'll just go right down the line here uh, and start with Lizzie. Hey, thanks, Patty. Um, I'm Lizzie Reese. I do project management at Urban Land Institute currently, um, where I manage a variety of web-based digital projects, as well as um, the maintenance and um, new enhancements on one of our key member tools. Um, and previously, I was working at a marketing agency overseeing um, website projects for our clients and technical SEO projects as well. Hello, everybody. I'm Saskia Plorge. I am currently a training manager at moveon.org, which is a digital first rapid response organization um, working for uh, community change across the country. Um, I currently um, support with creating content um, to train our members on tactics to mobilize communities around issue and electoral issues. Um, in the past, I've done um, some international project management as well, and have just generally done project management for nonprofit organizations, but specifically in the political realm. Hi everyone, my name is Courtney Matherly, and I am a senior project manager with Parsons TKO. Uh, my background spans communications, marketing, and media agency work. Um, I've managed clients, customers, and accounts in, in multiple roles, um, but have been with PGKO for just over five years and have experience running both agile and traditional projects um, during that time in partnership with now over 25 organizations spanning um, over 60 different engagements. Um, so I'm excited to be here today to talk to you all about my experience. Hi everyone, my name is Devin Beswick. I am a senior project coordinator here at PTKO. Um, I oversee uh, an array of different projects, uh, technical all the way to just some digital consulting projects as well. Uh, my background is in social work and I have, um, my project management background is uh, particularly in managing uh, implementation of mental health programs, um, as well as uh, consulting and evaluation projects as well. Excited to be on this panel with this group and to speak with you all. Thank you. Great. So hopefully y'all can tell we've got folks with a really wide range of experiences and backgrounds here. Um, and, you know, project management is applicable to just about anything one might do in their job. Um, but we're here today to talk specifically about digital projects um, and even more specifically about 
projects in the nonprofit space. And so um, I wanted to sort of ask folks that are here with us today to answer a poll. Um, and I will stop my screen share and we'll get that poll popped up for you on the screen. But about why, why is digital project management so hard in the nonprofit space? Um, I think most mission-driven organizations are dealing with budget constraints, time constraints. Um, people are doing project management, even though it's not their job. You may not have a dedicated project manager, or you may not have the luxury of working with external consultants. There's lots of silos. There's sort of a rapid pace of work. Um, there's lots of challenges in project management. And so um, I'm curious to hear from those of you that are on the call with us today, what are some of the biggest challenges? Um, and it's really interesting just watching these kind of filter in. It's sort of a little bit of everything, which is what we suspected. Um, but we'll let that roll for a minute if you want to fill that out. Um, okay. Looks like we've got a pretty good number of responses rolling in. So maybe we can share those results out, but um, what's interesting is it's actually fairly evenly split. Um, so I imagine probably some of you, what we should have had maybe is an all of the above option, but I was curious to see what the what the challenges that were your top concerns were, um, because these are things that we hear about a lot. Um, so I would love to kick us off by asking the folks on the panels what their perspective is on, you know, why is digital project management so hard, particularly in the nonprofit space? Um, and maybe I'll ask Courtney to kick us off on this one. Sure. Thanks, Patty. Um, I think, uh, you know, one of the kind of things that leads into project management being, you know, a little bit um, uh, did lending itself well to digital products, digital projects, excuse me, is the importance of it. Um, you know, I think sometimes it can often feel a little bit overlooked, um, but it's just such an essential part of making sure um, that time and resources are allocated correctly um, to make sure that, you know, teams are maximizing their efficient, efficiency um, and increasing the chances of success for the projects. Um, but I think, you know, as Patty kind of um, alluded to, um, you know, there's oftentimes no dedicated project manager to a lot of digital projects and people are doing it on top of their regular jobs and it's an additional um, uh, piece of their workload. Um, so that also often leads to resource constraints and people, um, you know, often have to juggle a lot of different hats um, and on top of kind of managing um, the, the projects themselves. Um, so that can kind of lend itself um, to some of the challenges encountered around timeline and, and budgets and things like that. Yeah, I think you make a really interesting point, which is that um, in resource constrained environments, PM can over, often be an overlooked function, right? Like we don't have enough budget to hire a PM or dedicate someone to this. So we'll just have whoever owns this product or tool kind of be the project manager. But the flip side of that is if you don't have good project management, there's a lot of inefficiencies. So you actually might wind up not spending your resources really well. Um, so I'll throw this out to the group, whoever wants to start. But, you know, when you have those resource constraints, what can you do to actually kind of manage your budget, stay within your budget, um, and use sort of the limited resources of your organization effectively? Does anybody want to dive in on that? I guess I can take a stab at this. Um, I find that even uh, as a organization as large as move on we still face a lot of these issues that um a lot of smaller organizations are facing and i see in this poll um sticking to project timeline and unclear communication are at a tie for the most important and um that's something that we constantly are facing at move on and something that i've noticed at other organizations that i've um, work that as well. I think that one thing I have relied on and that I see makes such a difference is templates. Um, establishing um, some sort of template, even if it's just an agenda template or um, a template that um, multiple teams can use and they can adjust as need be, 
I find to be very helpful. Um, at Move On, for any project that we do, um, one thing that we try to establish is some type of work plan that clearly establishes who is responsible for what, where can you go to for this piece of work, um, who is responsible for approving all pieces of work. Um, we refer to, refer to it as a MORCA, which just basically breaks down um, the manager, the organizer, um, who is responsible for what, who is consulted in the project. So maybe not involved, but just stakeholders that you're in communication with. And then who's approving all of this, um, all of the materials that are going out. So that's something that's really helpful. And I think um, kind of chucks away at the unclear communication. I think there are so many layers behind that, but that's one thing that we find very helpful. Um, and then sticking to project timeline, I'll just say this really quick. Working at a rapid response organization, we rarely have a timeline. Um, we can do all of the planning we want to do for six months. And then at the last minute, something happens in the news cycle and everything gets tossed out the window and we're starting from scratch. Um, and so I think even in that scenario, having a plan to refer to, even if you're tossing it out, you know exactly what you're not looking for. Um, and that's a better place than starting in the middle of a field with so many options to go off of. Um, so I think having a plan, even if the plan might be thrown out or it, it needs adjusting is really important. Jumping off of uh, that point on the importance of templates and planning ahead when you can, when it's possible. Um, something we've been doing at PTKO is we've implemented um, a task planning template to kind of ground our teams in the goal of the project and the various goals of the project and what value we're hoping to provide um, our clients. And I find that having something to refer back to or breaking down all of um, the activities in a project and getting to, okay, what do we need in order to move this forward? And how do we get it to um, a point that we feel good about and that uh, the client is, it's the most beneficial for the client as well. Um, it's definitely, like Siskia mentioned, it's not perfect. You won't always um, come back to it or it when you come back to it, maybe a few weeks later, that plan might look different, um, but it's still a great exercise to kind of ground the team in the goal of the work. Yeah, I, I like that because it's like knowing exactly what is in your scope is out of your scope. Having that um, is one of the major players or one of the major components of like making sure you stay within budget. Um, are there other tactics folks have used? I don't have a necessarily a tactic, but just a kind of a quick thought as we're talking about, you know, effectively managing and staying within budgets. I think it's important for, you know, within project management and for project managers, obviously to understand the constraints um, of our project, but also the, like the resources that they have access, access to. Um, so budget tracking obviously is a, is a particularly important piece of that. Um, but coming in, you know, I think that lends itself to often like the worry and main concern is going over budget. And, and that's a lot of the like, usual stress. Um, but I also think, uh, you know, counter thought to that is coming in consistently under budget. Um, so, you know, generally, you know, that can be seen as a win, but I also kind of challenge people to think of it um, as not necessarily always being a good thing. Um, it could be, you know, an indicator that you're missing an opportunity or even like an indicator of risk um, and making sure that you are delivering, um, you know, the value to your client or um, uh, to the, the team that you're working with. Um, so just, a, you know, one thing to, to think about too, in terms of success and how we look at and think of budgets um, is just, you know, also making sure that, you know, you aren't missing places where you can have your project teams dive in more um, and maybe coming in under a, a project budget means you can deliver, over deliver um, in a sense, uh, you know, to secure follow on work or 
um, you know, perhaps you just have the um, allocation space um, to do that. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. And I, I think, you know, one of the fundamentals for anyone who's maybe studied ma project management is that, you know, you kind of have your, your budget, your schedule or timeline and your scope, right? These are sort of the three key pillars. And if any one of those is out of whack, it's gonna affect all the others, right? So whether your budget is way over or way under, that either tells you something isn't going right, you're either not delivering on the scope or maybe you're getting things done more efficiently and quickly, but that also means you didn't estimate it correctly at the beginning to have all those things tied together. So, um, you know, those sort of metrics and things to track, they tell you something about how the work is going. Um, or they might tell you something about your underlying data and how, how accurate that is or not. Um, which kind of leads me to the next question we had is, you know, part of project management, I think, as a skill is, you know, sort of driving your team to get things done, keeping people on track. Um, and a lot of that can be sort of process management, right? We've talked about task planning and budget tracking and those sorts of things, but you really need your whole team's participation to get in on those um, so it can be tricky and people can sort of um, view that as a hassle, right? When the project managers are always following up on like, can you give me updates? Can you give a status report? Can you log your time? Like those sorts of things. So I want to know what sorts of tips and tricks you all have, um, you know, to kind of keep folks who are kind of doing the doing of the work, um, you know, get them to sort of participate in the processes that you want them to Um I don't know, Lizzie, maybe you want to start out on this one? Sure, yeah. So, I mean, I think the first step is just communicating at the start what the process was will be to all of the team members so everyone knows exactly what's expected. But if you tend to have an issue with people, um, they're new to the process, maybe they don't, they're not following it consistently, it can be helpful, especially in newer teams or if you're working with a new client, to try to identify a person who can be an advocate with you for the processes. So identify someone who... Um, can sort of speak to their team, speak to a larger team and sort of back you up on the processes. And that can help when you're entering sort of a new team or a new realm to, to sort of identify those people who can sort of advocate alongside you um, for those processes and the value that they can bring to the project. What yeah, and I'll jump in. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I was just going to jump in to say, I think, um, you know, because of the nature of the role of a project manager, it's very easy for PMs to kind of become the funnel and in some instances act as a go between for the project or the execution team and the client. Um, so I think, you know, kind of building off of what Lizzie was saying, the, um, you know, the PM team uh, and the PMs um, should include uh project team members on communications. So they're involved and kept in the loop and kind of, you know, get out of that. He said, she said, um, uh, type mode that I think can sometimes, um, be an issue. And I think the, the crux of it and what's really important to remember is that project managers are, you know, there to be the enforcers of, of process and not, you know, translators between what the project teams are, are working on um, and the client. Um, so it's it's really important to, to make sure that your teams are participating um, in, in that process. Yeah, I think... Um... To that point, communication is a major part of um, our job as project managers, um, but it's also a huge part of anyone's role that is working with clients or is just on a project and they have to deliver something. Um, I think oftentimes project teams can get caught up in relying on project managers to be the sole communicator. Um, and that hinders the rapport that you build with clients um, that can hinder relationships internally as well. And so kind of exercising that muscle or um, empowering your teams to exercise that muscle is also um, very beneficial to the process. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think, um, you know, project management is a, a skill and a role that I think can sometimes be undervalued by folks. Of course, not anyone on any of our teams, but I think there is always a risk that like PMing is seen as equivalent to admin support, right? It's the meeting scheduler, it's the communications manager. Um, but I, I really love the points you all are making, particularly about like PMs as guardians of process, right? Because if that sort of all falls apart, like it really is trickier to keep the, the project kind of 
um, on track. And that doesn't mean you have to have a dedicated PM to have process, right? Like anyone can be a sort of guardian of process, regardless of what that looks like. Um, and uh, I, I think that's really important. Um, we did have one question come through in the Q&A, and I will say I encourage anyone that's with us today, if you've got questions you'd like us to um, you know, ask to the panelists, please feel free to put them in the chat, put them in the Q&A, and we will make sure to, um, uh, to ask that. But the question was, um, Saskia, to your point about project managing in this really rapid response environment, um, you know, how do you have kind of governance or process in place that allows you to pivot quickly, right? Because I think sometimes like process can be seen as a thing that hinders agility. And so how do you think about that balance of like, we need a process, but it needs to be flexible so that if something changes, I can like, you know, it, I don't need like the world's most detailed schedule so that I have to update a hundred things every time a timeline changes. Like, how do you think about those balances? Yeah, this is such a great question. And um, I think um, Liz and Dev and Courtney have kind of alluded to it. Um, and the last question did too, but I think setting up proper channels for communication is the most important thing. Um, at Move On, things are constantly changing uh, and people are always looking for direction, like where to go for what, where I, a lot of people at Move On, I think, um, and I'm sure at a lot of other organizations doing similar work, um, an individual can be holding so much work and not know what to do with it, um, where to go to be able to move forward. And I think setting up proper channels uh, for people to know where to go. Um, this is a question I think we'll get to later, but um, tools are really important. Uh, I think that cuts a lot of the process out um, that you like to think of like scheduling meetings and creating tasks and things like that. Um, tools are really important. If a team is already using a tool that is helpful for them, as a PM, I think it's really important for you or whoever's in charge of um, guarding the processes of an organization or a team um, to be able to share. I think that, um, I'm sorry, I think that one thing I find important is having one link where somebody can click on and know where they can go if they're looking for information on a specific issue or if they need support on something. Um, we really value Slack spaces at Move On. So one Slack space with a pinned message with one link to a document that people can click on and find um, all the roles for a project. And um, if things change, where they can go to. Something very simple like that can go miles. So maybe people don't have the concrete information that they're looking for, but they know where to go to find that information or at least the information that we have at the moment. Um, I think that makes it very easy on the PM. There's you don't have to go many places to update information. You don't have to um, chase or um, herd the cattle, as we like to say. You don't have to herd the kitties in. Um, you, you post information one place and everybody sees it and everybody knows where to go. And you can move a lot of work there um, and change a lot of work um, as needed. So I hope that answered the question. I love yeah, that. Oh, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah. And I was just going to say, I'll build upon that a little bit. I think, um, you know, the fact is that uncertainty like is a fact, right? So um, I think we need to plan, um, but expect the unexpected. Um, so ensuring project management processes are designed to give flexibility is really important. Um, so, you know, making sure that we consider allowing changes to how things are done rather than what is done. Um, so I think that just means like staying very pragmatic. Um, and, you know, that 
often results in finding that tasks can be scaled back and resources can be freed up. Um, and, you know, if, if something's moving slowly, perhaps like, you know, there can be a, a team switch um, into other roles. Um, so I think, you know, the it's hard to, to put in like exact governance. Um, but I think, you know, the the real takeaway is that the, those formal project management processes are really important and project managers just need the flexibility to be able to deal with change circumstances. Um, so, you know, activities need to be done in such a way that they, they can be scaled up or down to, to suit the real project needs. Yeah, that's great. Um, and, you know, you both kind of touched on the idea of uh, processes and what tools can support those and, and how you can adapt to that. And um, there is a question in the chat about what tools you like. Um, I also kind of wanted to get a sense from the group. We're going to launch another quick poll about what tools you use. Um, so you'll see that come up on the screen because one of the things is you may not have like project management tools at your disposal, right? There are all sorts of kinds of things people use. Um, so maybe we could just do kind of a quick round robin of the panelists um, of what your favorite PM tools are and sort of the any tips and tricks you have for kind of, um, you know, kind of leveraging those. So uh, let's start with Devin. All righty. I was watching all those <laughs> poll responses come through. <laughs> it's very interesting to see what uh, other folks use. Um, I think oftentimes we PMs, we can get wrapped up in using, you know, project management tools, like this is the only way we can move work forward and see it in the most organized way, but that's not always um, available to many organizations. And so I think being able to maximize the use of Google Docs, like Siskiya was mentioning, creating Morkas or creating documents where everyone can live in one spot and people can easily um, reference the information that they need. Uh, additionally, I do enjoy using Otter for like phone calls or Zoom meetings and things like that. Um, it's nice to have a transcription to refer back to rather than um, needing to carve out time to listen to or uh, watch a recording. Um, you know, being able to just control F something is always a lot easier uh, than maybe listening to it. So I love that tool. Um, definitely have been using that more often these days. Um, and as well as teamwork, that's a huge tool for us. And um, it's a great way to keep our team organized, even if it's our clients are a little bit more reluctant to get in there and use it as well. Uh, Siskiya, what do you guys use at, at Move On? Yeah. Um, at move on, this is a very funny question because I feel like move on has a million tools and project management is something we're definitely working on. Um, because we're a digital first organization, I think that there are so many tools you can think of to have to send out emails, to send out text messages, to send out peer to peer messages. So, um, I think that they all require their own project management around. Um, I personally like to use, um, and anybody that works on a project with me will use um, Asana as a tool. I think it's a great way to keep track of all of the moving pieces. Um, and it's very easy to um, sync work with other teams on Asana um, to streamline work across organizations. Um, and I want to say this with a disclaimer that a lot of the work that we do is in-house. Um, so our project management is less client facing and more like internal stakeholder facing. Um, so Asana is one. Um, I think our team really values Google Docs, um, Google Drive in general. So just um, spreadsheets and one click docs is what we like to call them. So like one document where you can find absolutely everything that you need. Um, and then Slack. Uh, we live and breathe in Slack. Everything um, is in Slack. So I think those are the main tools that uh, we utilize 
over at Nuvon. That's great. What about you, Lizzie? What are your favorite tools that you use? Yeah, we also, I think teamwork's been mentioned a few times. Um, we use our, and are moving a lot in of projects into teamwork um, just because it's very easy to track. You have a lot of flexibility. You can do sort of Kanban boards. You can also have in their notebooks all of your project documentation within sort of the larger project planning um, portal. Um, also sort of SharePoint and just, um, I think Google Docs and spreadsheets can be really helpful. Um, even just as the project manager, when you're planning things out or drafting things out before they get into a project management tool, because once you get them in there, you start notifying people, people get several emails when you're making changes. So I think Google Docs um, and spreadsheets are also helpful. Um, and I think it's also helpful to keep in mind um, what the project team you're working with is used to. Um, so you may be working with a team um, who's very used to SharePoint, and it may just be best to work in SharePoint with them for the, for now. Um, but knowing the time and the place where it is good to encourage new systems and put those in place when they'll be the most valuable and sort of meeting your team where they're at with those. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, you know, a lot of you have mentioned PM specific tools like Asana or Teamwork. Um, you know, Courtney, are there any others that haven't been mentioned or maybe any other like non-traditional tools that you like to use and kind of hack your way into good PM process? Yeah, and not to, I mean, I, I will, my my personal favorite is um, teamwork. So I, I will give like one more little um, uh, thumbs up to that. Um, but tack on to that, that one reason I really like it is because I think, um, you know, as Lizzie was kind of saying, it, it allows for a lot of flexibility. And I know with you know, some of our clients who, you know, maybe a little bit um, like tool adverse or, you know, don't want kind of one more thing to have to um, log into or worry about. Um, it still really allows us to do all of the like project management um, and follow our project management process um, without necessarily having to force um, the client into the tool. Um, so for instance, it has um, aliases that allow you to just like tag on and, and add to the CC line of a traditional email um, that will capture communications and the tool. You can also like create and send tasks from email. Um, so I just think it provides a lot of flexibility um, that will that's um, helpful for folks who are, you know, more or less willing um, to dive into the tool. Um, but outside of, you know, kind of more traditional or structured um, uh, systems, I'm still like a big pen to paper list girl. Um, so that's kind of how I manage um, you know, my day to day and my week. Um, so I spend much of my Fridays, um, which, you know, we at PTKO kind of have heads down time. So, you know, I spend a couple hours um, every Friday, just kind of looking ahead and imagining what, you know, my next week is going to look like on all my various projects. Um, and just kind of actually like physically writing down um, what the main priorities are, um, what folks are working on, um, and what's coming up. Yeah, those are all great. And the, the couple of themes I heard through what everyone shared is regardless of what tools you're using, right, meeting people where they are. And so making sure that process like isn't adding just one more thing or like a whole other system that people need to check in their day to day and also having everything in one place. So there are tools like teamwork that track budget, schedule, tasks, like all in one thing. But I think, Saskia, you sort of mentioned like it can be a Google Doc, right? And and if the PM is in charge of of um, keeping that up to date, like, uh, you know, it can just be something super simple that everyone else knows where to go and just have everything in one place. So those are um, all really helpful, regardless of what tools someone is using. Um, I'm going to turn to a couple of the questions that came in from the folks joining us today. Um, so the first one, uh, Tamika asks, what tips do you all have for thinking about end to end digital transformation process as part of effective PM? For example, are, do you have suggestions for tasks that could be completed up front to ensure successful management and launch of a project? Yeah, I'm gonna dive in on that. Maybe as a more tactical starting place for the convo, kind of what are your critical upfront tasks that you think set a project up for success? I think the first thing that's coming to my mind is um, going back to what I had mentioned earlier about the task planning template. 
Um, that is an exercise that we typically do before the project begins. Um, and I think that typically when we do that, a lot of times the team will say, oh, we can actually do this before we even kick off. Like we can get this work done um, maybe in the first week of the project and then we don't have to think about it again. Like as long as we kind of rallying with the team, what do we need in order to drive certain activities forward? And can we get this ahead of time? How how soon can we get this so that we can complete this work? And then it will set us up um, to be in a different place um, once the project does kick off. I'll also jump in on this question. Um, one thing that um, comes to mind um, at in our this current role at Move On, I think that um, in the various projects that we've had, one thing we've figured that determines whether our end product will be a success or not is whether a clear scope has been developed. So, like um, having like a smaller conversation with immediate stakeholders, like people that are owning or managing the project, to figure out like what your goals are, what you want the end product to be, what you would like, and then having a wider conversation, but maybe not as public, but just a wider conversation with the necessary stakeholders. And when I think about these people, I think about if things hit the fan, who are the people that I need to be able to salvage this? Like, who do I absolutely need if I think I have two months to plan this project and then I find out I only have three days to plan this project, who do I absolutely need to push this forward? Um, and I find that if I include those people very early on and I come with them with a clear plan, um, I know that whatever happens, whatever happens, because anything could happen, um, what we say at Move On, if anything happens, we know that it'll be okay because the stakeholders that matter are in the conversation and they are just looped in um, and they know what's going on. I think just to add to what Saskia mentioned, um, it is critical at the beginning of projects to identify not only those critical players, but also any groups that may be affected and even if they're only going to be affected slightly, even if they're going to participate in one workshop or you just need their input on one design revision, whatever it will be, making sure that you're going to them early and saying, this project exists, I will be coming to you over the next few months. Please don't be surprised when I contact you in three months for your input. Um, so it's important to get everyone, um, I mean, even if, if you don't end up needing them or something changes, um, you can still keep them in the loop and make sure they're, you know, consulted as necessary, but it's, it's important to make sure everyone knows it exists and is happening and not to assume that they've been told if you haven't made that contact with them yourself. Yeah, those internal communications are really important. Um, a couple other things that came to me as you all were talking, one is um, gathering documentation up front, like so often when you're starting down the path of a digital project, like some piece of this has been thought about before, right? Someone has run a survey or there's internal process documentation or there's the way we already do it or used to do it or the tool has its own documentation. And so one of the things we do often is just like a very big like documentation gathering um, of literally anything that exists related to the project so that the team can really digest that up front. And sometimes it does like adjust your scope, right? Like, oh, we actually don't need to go as deep on this or someone has already sorted through this stuff. We have what we need. Um, and then uh, the other thing that came up for me, and, and maybe I honed in a bit on the word in the question, it was about digital transformation projects and sort of the idea of transformation and change in an organization. One of the things we really like to do at the beginning of any large project is a workshop that we call capacity for change and really evaluating what change and transformation looks like at the organization and what makes that a success. And so bringing together all the key players who are working on the project, as well as those that are going to be impacted by it and saying, you know, the last time we did a big project like this, whether it was a big upgrade to a technology or a platform migration or any kind of rollout, how did it go? And what did we learn from that? And 
are there things in our organization that make timing better or worse, right? Like, is everybody, you know, busy around election time? And so we should definitely not roll it out in October or November, right? So really just thinking through what change and transformation looks like at your organization and being, you know, kind of realistic with yourself at the beginning of a project is much better than kind of getting to the end and being like, oh, wait, we can't launch this now because the election is next week. So um, those sorts of things I think are really helpful up front also. Um, okay, another question we've got that says, um, you know, a lot of the conversations we've had right now can be carried through different types of projects. Are there any tips you all have for digital projects in particular, things that are technology, web related, um, you know, like what makes those digital projects different and how do you tackle those? Um, so Courtney, do you want to dive in on that one to get started? Yeah, um, I would love to. Yeah, I think, um, you know, digital projects can be tough. Um, there's often, you know, a lot of moving parts and it's easy to like, you know, lose track of what's been done or who's doing what and um, can, you know, be really overwhelming to think about it as a whole. Um, so I think, you know, the first kind of immediate thought that comes to mind when thinking about um, that specific type of project work is to, um, you know, make sure you're choosing a project methodology that like really fits the work um, and, you know, can be um, an important kind of factor um, to think through in terms of the team you're working with as well. Um, and just to make sure that you're in agreement and get input on, you know, making sure everyone's ready um, to adopt and, and execute on that. Um, you know, I also think a big thing um, that lends itself well to, to digital projects is, you know, being able to kind of commit to continuous improvement. Um, you know, typically digital projects are, you know, really rapid and iterative. Um, so I think, you know, it's really important to um, be open and committed to, you know, being um, agile and being ready to kind of, um, you know, champion things that you're learning along the way um, and making sure you're bringing those learnings to your team. Um, I think some other things that come to mind, you know, is also kind of building trust, um, you know, through being very transparent with, um, with your clients and who you're working with, um, you know, making sure you're explaining some of the complexities, um, you know, when there is an issue, um, kind of doing the appropriate amount of investigation and prep, um, to, you know, take that to um, the client. Um, and then I think it also kind of goes back to making sure you've created and kind of standardize, um, you know, processes for that type of work um, that can kind of, you know, keep it um, on track and will kind of help prevent it from spiraling. Um, so, you know, making sure you have procedures for things like um, project initiation and getting things kicked off um, and that you're kind of thinking through each phase of the project. Um, so thinking through, you know, the initial initiation and, you know, as we've already said, kind of documentation and preparing resources um, thinking through onboarding um, and then kind of moving into the planning phase of work to create tasks and uh, making sure everyone understands the budget and the schedule um, and then, you know, sliding into the execution piece of things where you're managing those tasks and you're collaborating as a team, um, you're reporting out on progress. Um, and then as you wrap, you know, making sure that um, you've provided the value that you had said that you would and committed to, um, and then kind of debriefing and retroing um, to make sure that you're learning from the work. Yeah, I may chime in too on, on the technical end. Um, one thing I find is uh, I really think the PM role is even more critical on technical projects. And I think sometimes for folks just starting out in their PM career, um, it can feel intimidating. But I often tell our team and, and other PMs I've worked with, like, you serve this really critical role as kind of a technical translator. Um, and I encourage our PMs to internally, before they ever meet with clients, to ask questions of our technical teams and the folks doing the work until you understand. 
because the PMs can really be that person that says like, let's get it explained in a way that makes sense to me, um, you know, who is typically not a developer or may not have that deep of a technical background. And then explaining it to clients becomes so much easier. And so the PMs really serve this function that like, you know, sometimes, I mean, developers are brilliant, brilliant people, but I think sometimes we need a translator to sort of say, okay, what does that mean in business value terms? What is the impact going to be? Um, and PMs are just so critical in playing that role. And um, I really applaud you all who are doing that tough work. Um, all right, we've got a whole bunch of other questions that have just poured in. So I'm going to try and get through these and just maybe ask one or two of you each to answer them as we are getting to our final minutes here. Um, the first one is, could you speak about dealing with scope creep from both clients and stakeholders and how do you spot it before it happens or deal with it when it comes up? Anybody want to chime in on that one? Um, oh, go ahead, Lizzie. Oh, sorry. I'll just say quickly, just one thing to keep in mind with scope creep is however you handle the first requests will set the tone for others' expectations throughout the project. So when you get that first request that you know is a little out of scope, it's important that you don't say, we'll take care of it this time, you know, no worries, we'll just slip it in, because then that person's not going to understand down the line when all of a sudden you're like, no, this is extra budget, this is extra time, here are the implications. So it's important that even the very first time you start notice those things come in, um, that you communicate that this could have, you know, budget or timeline implications, let me assess this and get back to you. And you don't just slip things in um, to sort of keep people happy at the beginning. Yeah, and I'll just tag on um, that I think it's, it's important to kind of trust your gut and your intuition and your instinct about what you think those things may be from the offset. Um, what I really like to be in the practice of doing um, is, you know, kind of identifying those things um, with the project team as you kind of like internally ready to kick off and then bring that to the, the kickoff with the client. Um, so even if it's a simple slide that kind of says like, very clearly, like, this is what we're going to deliver, or this is what we mean by, you know, configuration, um, and like what that will mean for you and the delivery. And just so you can kind of from the offset, make sure you're aligned and on the same page. And if there ever is a question um, about, you know, that component of, of your project work, you have something to very easily go back and point back to. Those are both such great answers. I think underlying it too is like, don't assume people have read the contract or the project charter or whatever. Saskia, did you want to add something there too? Yeah, I just, um, those are both such great answers. Um, and I just wanted to say to Courtney's point, um, after you bring that up the first time, keep bringing it up. I find that um, reiterating it, even if people are annoyed at it, at least they can't say that they didn't know. And I find that to save my butt <laughs> so many times because um, people, you're putting it out there. And even if you're putting it out there 7 billion times, at least it's clear. And um, yeah, there's no confusion about it. <laughs> really good point. All right. Um, Grace asked us about advice for project management when you only have two people. Um, because it can be so easy to skip process with smaller teams. Um, oh my gosh, this one resonates a lot because I think in the work that we do at PTKO, some of the projects are big and have six people working on them and last a whole year and some is like two people. Um, so I don't know, anyone want to dive in on that one and how you adapt with smaller projects? I can jump in here quickly. Um, the first thing that comes to my mind is trust. Um, there is a level of trust when you're working, when you have a team of two that really needs to be there and it needs to be deep. Um, what happens is if trust is not there, roles become blurred um, and project responsibilities get blurred or one person can end up um, kind of taking over the project. Um, and not really, the other one is kind of just hanging out on the side. And I think that can definitely happen very easily. And so it's almost, I think, even more important to project manage and to have like, to be using tools and things like that um, when there are only two people, because as mentioned in the, um, in Patty's point, I think sometimes some of those processes can fall by the wayside when there's only two people. 
I know Saskia had a point, so I'll let you uh, go, Sas. Thanks, Dev. Um, yeah, uh, what Dev mentioned about trust, I think that's very important as well. Um, I think in my experience working at small, smaller nonprofits that do a lot of um, work on the national and even international stage, I think that a lot of times people think that there are a lot of people doing the work behind it. And realistically, there are only like 20 people um, on the team. And those teams are also very small as well. Um, and so, yes, a lot of times like processes fall off um, and that could be a good thing. And that could also not be a good thing um, when it starts to, um, sometimes be harmful to yourself as an individual or to the work that you're doing. Um, and so in those cases, um, I would recommend um, including others where you can or um, sharing things in public spaces so that even though, yes, it is between you two people, um, at least there's somebody else in there that may not be as directly involved in the work, but it has eyes on the work or is aware that the work is moving um, and can check in and um, and see how everything is going. I also, speaking to the trust thing, I really do think that's the most important thing. And um, creating space for feedback with your, your other counterpart your other counterpart, especially if it's just the two of you on a team, I think um, allowing space for constructive um, feedback, good and bad, whether that be taking time weekly to meet um, and during your one-on-ones, you highlight the great stuff that happened and maybe one or two bad things. Maybe there's never any bad things, but I think always creating that space for feedback so that when there is something that um, happens when a process falls off that you might want to bring up, there's space already there um, to do so. Those are all great ideas. All right, we are just coming up on time and we've got one question left that I'm going to ask folks. Um, maybe we'll do a quick kind of round robin rapid fire. So Kevin is asking um, kind of two related questions about projects ending. So the first is um, what happens when a project is completed? What's helpful? We've tried to do postmortems with varying degrees of success, you know, reviewing what we did, closing out. Um, should we make a new template or process? And a related question, how do you celebrate a launch or a completion, especially when we're virtual? It's kind of hard to celebrate wins, um, but we want to keep people engaged and rewarded. So um, we'll go around the horn here and see if folks have, you know, what is your favorite practice for either doing a project retro or wrap up or celebrating the end of a project? Um, Courtney, you want to get us started? Sure. Um, I think uh, in terms of project closeout, um, you know, we've worked really hard at Parsons. The PM team has worked really hard and really diligently at like defining um, a series of activities for closeout. Um, and I won't, you know, go into all those now at the time we have left, but Kevin, I'd be happy to connect and with you and, and share those in more detail. Um, but speaking to kind of the postmortem or retro specifically, um, you know, we uh, have had varying degrees of success with those as well. Um, but I found, you know, kind of more recently, we've just started to really shift our attention to the action planning portion of it. Um, and for a closeout of a project, Project, um, not too long ago, you know, one thing it, we did was make an action plan to templatize one of the activities that we had done in the project. Um, so what that looked like for us was I scheduled a series of meetings um, for a portion of that project team. And just for like a few weeks, they met once a week and worked on that specific thing to actually dedicate time. Um, so I think it's just being very intentional about, you know, creating space for following through on that action item and not just writing it down and kind of leaving it there is like a checkbox for someone to come back to, but actually putting, you know, time on the calendar for it to be worked on. Um, and then in terms of celebrating um, launches or completions, um, I mean, I think, yeah, it's definitely more challenging um, being, you know, a in a remotely based company, but I think, um, you know, 
recognizing one another. So we do a lot of that over Slack and kind of celebrating people um, and acknowledging people's hard work um, is super, super important. Um, and then just making sure, you know, if you don't already have opportunities at Parsons, you know, we have a, a coffee break um, that everyone can get together and we have water coolers that we see each other. But if you don't have those in place, um, you know, getting kind of intentional about, you know, getting a, on a Zoom or on a call and just being able to, um, you know, say cheers and job well done. All right, Lizzie, what about you? What are your favorite project wrap up things? Yeah, I think the main thing that's coming to mind as a tip for sort of retrospectives is I like to send out a survey before we all get to the retrospective that can also be anonymous. And so then I can sort of take the very truthful feedback, put that in a PowerPoint and just have it as a starting off point. This is how people were feeling during the survey. Who wants to take it from here? Are there other comments? Because I think people can sometimes be shy about giving true feedback or constructive feedback. So if you sort of take that onus out of people speaking up verbally in the meeting in front of everyone, you can sort of have a starting off point to, to let them, um, and you get better feedback as well and more honest feedback if you do that. Um, and in terms of celebrating, yeah, of course, I think sort of those virtual non-work um, sessions or happy hours are always good. And also always try to schedule them with normal work hours. Don't make people stay to 5.30 for their virtual happy hour. That's when people get upset, but get the approval to do um, a 4 p.m. happy hour so people can really you know, step in and enjoy that time. Love that. Saskia, any thoughts on project wrap-ups? Yeah, um, again, a lot of the work that Move On does is um, internal in terms of who we are working with. Um, so our project wrap-ups um, typically look like um, the project manager um, working with who, whichever stakeholders to kind of digest a lot of the information that we capture. Um, at Move On, we try to capture as much information as we can, um, and that would, um, and then we also would do a debrief um, with stakeholders that were involved in the program, um, and then all of that information would just be a report back, which would be sent to all of our staff and stakeholders that were involved. Um, so that's what our the end of a project typically looks like. Um, and then in terms of celebration, I think this is so important. Um, I think in um, the movement work that Move On does, people forget to celebrate our wins, even though they're very small wins. So we do a lot of recognition as well internally. We do a lot of appreciation posts in emails and in Slacks. Um, so many times people are, there are many spaces in Slack for um, appreciation. And then our members are also so important to us. We have millions of members across the country that do incredible, incredible work. Um, we have um, hundreds of volunteers that phone bank with us, that send text messages, that um, show up to lobby visits, that write letters, that call center. They do so much work. And so um, we do like to appreciate them as well. Um, we send out a lot of free swag um, and just always find time to um, create um, moments for them to celebrate, whether that be um, in our mobilizer community that we have with um, a few members and um, you know celebration calls that we have for our members. So just always trying to be creative um, in finding ways to celebrate the work that our members do for us. Great. Devin, anything to add from your perspective about ends of projects? Yeah, everyone touched on some really great points. Um, kind of going back to what Lizzie was saying about collecting feedback, um, I think that is an amazing way to close out a project, you know, to just kind of get a sense of how folks were feeling throughout the process um, and being able to um, kind of move accordingly once like once you have that feedback and maybe adapt um, your processes or um, adjust kind of approaches next time around in terms of celebration. And actually, this will get back to this is tied together with closing out projects as well. Um, but I think providing like tangible something like evidence to show whether it's like internally or, or to clients to say, like, look what we've done. <laughs> like, yes, we might have just implemented a platform or implemented a new CRM, but like this is what this 
thing can do now. This is what your organization will be able to do with this work. Um, and it, it wasn't just like 10, 12, 15 meetings and, you know, throughout your days and weeks. And um, it wasn't just a lot of like hard work, you know, that all amounted to something. And I think being able to show that um, to, to everyone is, is very valuable and worth celebration. That's awesome. Well, that is a great note to end on. Thank you so much for um, that question, Kevin. But um, I really appreciate everyone giving their insights today. Thanks to Courtney, Lizzie, Siskia, and Devin for sharing their expertise. And thanks to all of you for joining us. Um, I hope you found something interesting in the conversation today. And if you had questions you didn't get a chance to ask, please uh, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, you'll be getting a follow-up email with some of the resources we talked about today, as well as uh, information if you want to get in touch. Um, Mickey's also sharing um, you know, our, our slide that says, please take our free content. Um, we've got lots of other recordings of past webinars, blog posts, podcasts, um, other content on our website. You can also find all of our future events. Um, I think we're planning to do a sort of retro on Giving Tuesday in December, which will be really exciting. So talking about wrapping up projects, that'll be a great opportunity to do that. Um, so thanks to everyone for joining us today, and we hope to see you again sometime soon. Take care.